Now, we have some French speakers in the congregation, so I apologise in advance for my poor French pronunciation. This is a quote from Charles Baudelaire. La plus belle des ruses de diable est de vous persuader qui n'existe pas, which means the finest trick of the devil is to persuade you that he does not exist. And by inference from that, he will try to persuade you that God doesn't exist as well. One of the proofs that the devil does exist is actually commemorated on this very day because this day is Remembrance Day. And Remembrance Day began sometime after World War I. And it was in remembrance of the terrible sacrifices that were made on that day. And I would like you this morning to recognise that by bowing your heads in silence while we take a little thought about the sacrifice of others that gave us the freedoms that we have, but also the sacrifice of so many in the past, and particularly those who sacrificed their lives in the name of the Lord. Let's just take a moment of silence to think about these things and then I'll pray. We thank you that we are living in a time of peace. We recognise the sacrifices that were made in order to give us that peace. But we recognise also that that peace is a very fragile thing. It is so easily broken. It is broken simply by us becoming combative in certain situations. And we have to remember that that is something that the devil wants, not you. We remember that famous saying of Luther, let the minds clash, but keep the fists down. And in doing so, I pray that as I speak this morning, you will help us to have an understanding of what you would have us to know without us becoming antagonistic or aggressive towards those who believe otherwise. And help us to show the spirit of Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Two Sabbaths ago was supposed to be Creation Sabbath, but because of the uh, clash with the 500th anniversary of the Reformation, uh, that didn't happen, so we're having our Creation Sabbath, as it were, today. And apparently this Sabbath is meant to be about stewardship, so I brought that into uh, my talk this morning, my sermon this morning, in a little way, and asked the question, of what are we stewards? And there are multiple answers to this one. We are stewards of the earth. That's what God gave us to look after. Genesis 2.15 tells us that and other texts as well. We are stewards of our bodies. We find that in 1 Corinthians 3.16 and 17, that we need to look after our health. We are stewards of our means, as we've just given. We are stewards of our means to assist the cause of God, and that is found in Malachi 3.10. And most importantly, we are stewards of the Word of God. And I'll be speaking a little bit about that this morning, but in a way that perhaps um, will seem a little unusual to some. There are many texts referring to that, as you can see from here. Psalm 111, uh, sorry, 119, 11, 42, 74, 105, 162, all in that one psalm. John 17, 4, Revelation 22, 18 and 19. That stewardship of the word of God brings up part of the great controversy that we sometimes don't think about, but we should. You remember the parable that Jesus told about the talents, about the unfaithful servant who took his talent and buried it in the earth? It produced no income, no interest. Um, it did nothing, really. And that's exactly what happened to the word of God for hundreds of years. It was buried away and chained, as it were, um, and was unavailable, uh, unavailable except to a very few. And Luther found that, but thank the Lord, he found a copy of the Word of God and he studied it assiduously, and that's what brought us the Reformation. But it is possible to chain up the Word of God 
and replace it with something else. So my sermon this morning is entitled, Why God? The Beginnings of Modern Atheism. We have two great conflicts, uh, as it were, spiritual conflicts in this world today. And that is the conflict between truth and false religion and the the conflict between truth and false science. And we'll be talking a lot about that. So in Luther's day, it was a conflict between the word of man and the word of God. And it was all about authority. Who do we accept as authority? The word of the Pope or the word of the Bible? That was Luther's conflict. And it's going on still. The word of man versus the word of God in theological issues continues. In 2017, and once again, it's all about who has the authority. But there's a new conflict that has been going on now for 170 years, roughly. And it's about authority as well. What is authority? What authority does scripture have versus what the writings of science tell us? And what has happened is that we have had the word of God largely replaced by the word of man, beginning with the words of one man, Charles Darwin. And again, it's about authority. Who has the authority? Darwin began at the age of 22. This is a painting of him just after he was married and embarked on a voyage around the world in the ship, the HMS Beagle, for several years, studying nature and going from place to place and particularly the Galapagos Islands where he began to formulate his views on the origin of living things and the origin of species. Now, some people believe that uh, on his deathbed or sometime before, that Darwin became a Christian. Did Darwin die a Christian? This is a good question. All I can do is answer that by quoting you from a letter that he wrote to an inquirer only two years before his death. And it said, I am sorry to inform you that I do not believe in the Bible as a divine revelation and therefore not in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. Yours faithfully, Charles Darwin. That's a sad letter to write and we cannot be his judge. But it does indicate that his belief and his writings tell us that there was no place in his scheme of things for God. Around about the same time, we had this man, who was no doubt influenced somewhat by what Darwin had said, but found his own ideas as well on this political sphere when he said, religion is the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world and the soul of soulless conditions. It is the opium of the people. Basically, what he was saying is that people who believe in God are addicted And his disciple, Lenin, who was one of the chief founders of the revolution that came to Russia, said, Atheism is a natural and inseparable part of Marxism of the theory and practice of scientific socialism. You will find today that amongst universities and places of higher learning, and particularly schools of biology, there is a nexus between these theories in politics and these theories in evolution. Once again, it's about authority. This man bristled with authority, but he claimed for some of his policies, particularly eugenics, that is taking people who he perceived as being inferior and experimenting upon them, again, about authority. That was based on some of his understanding of evolution. 
And we still have it. <laughs> authority. Who has the authority on the world? But the authority I'm about to talk about is what I call the new authority, the authority of science, because everybody now believes in science in one way or another, and some worship it. The new authority. This is particularly true of our young people. And if you were to go onto the internet and look at the blogs that exist with regard to evolution, you will find a battle going on. Um, particularly if anybody goes into those blogs and begins to talk about God and creation. The response is vile, is foul very often. Um, the language is abominable. And it's very clear that this is a battle, a fight, a war that is going on. And it is part of the great controversy and it is part of the great controversy that is most affecting our young people and it's taking our young people, including in this church, our Adventist church, I don't mean this particular church, but in our church, it's taking them out in the droves. In Luther's time, it was a theological debate because everybody would accept, most people at least, would accept that there was a God, but it was about who's God and what God and who had the authority to actually give us access to that God. It was a theological debate between the words of God and the words of man. And it led to a religious reformation. Currently, there is going on a scientific debate. And it's between the words of man, or man's science, and God's science. And it is leading to a scientific reformation. We would hope that would be a positive one. Now, the Apostle Paul wrote in Romans to groups of people which included those who knew the scripture and those who did not. And Romans 1, 19 and 20 is actually speaking to those people who, or about those people who did not know anything about the Hebrew scripture at all. They were pagans. And this is what he said. He said, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. He's referring to those people who did not know the scripture, but he says, look, just examine nature and you will find God in nature. And if you don't, you have no excuse. He wasn't arguing from scripture. He could argue from scripture, he knew it well, but he was arguing from science. What is science? Science is the observation of nature and inference from that observation. And inference can include calculation, the use of mathematics. And we'll get into that a little bit as we go on. What did Paul say? His invisible attributes are clearly seen being understood by the things that are made. So Paul was arguing from science, not from theology. Here's a current journalist, Greg Sheridan, who is the foreign correspondent for The Australian, who said this, the idea of God is perfectly logical. He said it is more rational to believe in God than to believe there is no God. This is a very recent article in The Australian. In fact, belief in God is much more rational than atheism. The resting place of the mind, its natural equilibrium is, as it were, is belief. Nonetheless, you can get to a knowledge of the reality of God through reason alone. More or less echoing the words of, of Paul. Now, to understand what is happening here, um, we need to understand what is declared by Darwinism or by neo-Darwinism. Luther's 95 theses were put there as counter-arguments to what was being stated by the papacy. 
he had to deal with the opposition. It's okay to state truth, but when you have to face error, you have to deal with the error. And so, what we hope to do is the same thing. The tenets of neo-Darwinism quickly, our life arose from non-life. This is what they say. Evolution requires many, many small genetic changes to living organisms, usually over very long periods of time, and that's what we call the genotype, the changes in the genes, that ultimately develop into new species. Those genetic changes must be advantageous to either survival or reproductive ability from one generation to another. The genetic changes produce structural or behavioural changes in the organism, that is, how it looks, how it is, the phenotype, that improve their environmental adaptability. The genetic changes are caused by mutations and are random and undirected. Nobody says this mutation is going to happen. It just happens, according to them. And we know that is true, that mutations just happen, maybe from cosmic radiation, maybe from other reasons. Unfavourable genetic changes cause a decline or extinction of species. The environment of itself cannot cause genetic change. Mutation is random. The environment only selects favourable genetic mutations that have already occurred. For example, they say that the creatures that developed a good fur coat when the Ice Age came, they were the ones that survived, and the ones with the skinny coat froze to death. That's what they claim. Let's look at life arising from non-life because that is the big Achilles heel as being discovered. It was suggested that perhaps the first spontaneous generation of life was the development of a protein, a complex molecule known to be part of living things, a very important part of living things, and that it's somehow a protein assembled itself by chance from what originally was called like a primordial soup um, where various molecules were floating around and joined to each other and oh, suddenly we've got a protein, the, the, one of the bases of life. Let's have a look at that. Proteins are made up of hundreds of amino acids which are less complicated molecules but nevertheless they have their own complexity and there are 20 different kinds of them. So, given enough time, could a useful protein assemble itself by spontaneous combination of amino acids? That's the question. Remember, though, that useful proteins must have their amino acid types arranged in an exact sequence. So, I put together what I call the Lego model of protein synthesis. Imagine a bag of Lego bricks that contain bricks of 20 different colours, each colour representing a different amino acid. And the bag has an inexhaustible supply of bricks. So let's see if we can make a protein by chance. Now I'm going to show you how a protein is made and you've got to work out whether this could happen by chance. Here is our model. This is the pattern that we want to copy. So here's our first amino acid, and there is one in 20 chance that you will choose the correct one. That one's been chosen the correct one. And here's another one. One in 20 chance that that will be correct. And the next one, another one in 20 chance that that will be correct. And the next one, another one in 20 chance that that will be correct. And again, and again, and away we go. Each time there is only a 1 in 20 chance that that amino acid will be the right one. So for this little amino acid, what we call a polypeptide, to form in this sequence, the random chance of it happening exactly like that is 20 multiplied by itself 20 times. That's a pretty big number already. If this process goes on until the chain is 150 bricks long, the chances of this happening randomly in this order is 20 times itself 150 times. Now we're getting into serious numbers. 
This prospect was looked at by this man by the name of Douglas Axe, who is um, a biologist and a uh, very uh, exceptional author who wrote this book, Undeniable, and I would recommend it to you. It's an amazing book. And he put up this challenge to calculate the mathematical chance of a single protein of 150 amino acids assembling itself from basic molecules randomly. And this is the number that he came up with. The probability is 1 in 10 to the 164th power. Here's our blackboard. Let's have a look at that number. How small is it? 1 divided by this number. Pretty impressive. Now, there's this advertisement on the television, no doubt you've seen, which says, if I were a betting man, I would use this betting app. <laughs> well, if I were a betting man, I don't think I'd be betting on a horse with that risk of winning. In fact, I don't think there's ever been a horse <laughs> that would have that chance of winning. What is this chance in real life? Well, here we go. If you throw a dice and you want it to come up six every time, that number that I just gave you, 1 in 10 to the 164th, is like throwing a dice and getting six up every time, without exception, 170 times in a row. Any time you have a dice, just give it a go. <laughs> You'll be there a long time. <laughs> could this have actually happened? Is it possible that could happen? Well, this man, William Dembski, is actually a mathematician. And he looked at the numbers and worked out by this particular proposition that the total number of chemical reactions possible if every atom in the known universe, and that's, we believe, 10 to the 80th atoms, reacted with every other atom in the universe as quickly as we know atoms can react with each other over the assumed lifetime of the universe, and they tell us that it's 14 billion years old, mm -hmm. that would create 10 to the 140th reactions. Now, we just worked out that for a protein to assemble itself, we need, it's 1 in 10 to the 164th. So there's a shortfall here, there's a problem, because if every atom was reacting with every other atom, it's still short of the 1 in one, 10 to the 164th. This is the difference, 10 to the 24th. How big is that? There it is. It's that many times less chances for one protein molecule to form spontaneously than all the atoms in the universe reacting with each other for 14 billion years in a vain attempt to do so. That gets very, very close to what we would say is impossible. Or not on, as we would say in Australia. Now... Not only is it impossible for one protein to form spontaneously, but we could look at a computer-generated video of random molecules sort of reacting with each other and watch and see what happens. And this is what happens. You can see that chains are forming, things are joining together and forming bigger things apparently, then, oh, hang on, bits are breaking off, things are changing shape, they're doing all sorts of strange and wonderful things, Nothing there is stable. It's changing all the time. A protein's got to be stable. It's got to have the same sequence every time. It doesn't work. As fast as the structures are formed, they break up into different shapes. The order of atoms changes and is random. It changes all the time, so the shape is constantly changing. And a protein needs to be in the correct order of molecules every time in one shape and must not break down. So we've got a problem, or at least, not we, 
But neo-Darwinism has a big problem. Living matter is so complex that even if all the atoms in the universe were allowed to react with each other for many times longer than the most extreme calculations of the age of the universe, they would fail to make a single functional protein. Even if that did happen, no protein can reproduce itself. So it's not life. Even if that did happen, proteins break down very quickly into their constituent molecules so the process would have to start over and over and over again ad infinitum. And DNA, which we do know is the basis of life, is far more complex than protein, is even less likely to form spontaneously and is much more likely to break down. It is very hard to keep DNA in a test tube without it breaking down, let alone in the normal environment. There's still more problems. As I said, proteins are not self-replicating. They disintegrate very quickly. The self-replicating basis of life is actually DNA or RNA, not protein. And those molecules are much more complex. So it makes the possibility of spontaneous generation of DNA and RNA even less likely than that of a protein. Let's look again at those tenets. Looks like life arising from non-life is not on. What about evolution requiring many, many small genetic changes to living organisms, usually over long periods of time? No new species have, can be demonstrated to be informed by mutation. Problem there. The genetic changes must be advantageous to survival or reproductive ability. Most mutations to the order of about 1,000 to 1 are detrimental. They actually damage the organism and cause it to die. Genetic changes produce structural behavioural changes in the organism that improve environmental adaptability. Most new mutations decrease survival and cause early death. A few examples. The snake with two heads, not likely to survive better than one with one. And that poor deer there with six legs, is it six? Yes, six legs instead of four, it's not going to survive nearly as long as the normal deer. And that was a result of the Chernobyl radiation reaction. So all of these things that we've got here they don't stand up. What about mutations and how they are random and undirected? And what about the genetic changes that cause decline or extinction of species? And Darwinism states that the environment of itself cannot cause genetic change. Mutation is random, it just happens. The environment only selects favourable genetic mutations that have already occurred. That's what they say. What about these mutations? This man, Marcel Paul Schutzenberger, who's a mathematician, very smart individual, uh, attended a conference in 1966 of biologists and mathematicians to work out whether it was possible for mutations to actually explain the derivation of, of, of uh, species. And this is what he said. The theory of evolution that depends on uniformly random occurring mutations cannot be the truth because the number of mutations needed to create the speciation that we observe and the time that would be needed for those mutations to have happened by chance exceed by thousands of orders of magnitude the time that has been available. Now, problem number three. Up until 10 or 15 years ago, we used to believe that the gene was so important, the DNA was so important that it was kind of a self-propelling organism or a self-propelling system and that the environment couldn't really do anything about it. Sorry, that's wrong. The recent science of epigenetics has shown us that DNA mutation is not the way changes in body shape may occur in response to environmental change and that the environment affects the way genes are turned on or off to modify body shapes in many ways. In other words, the process is directed by the environment. It even can affect the lifespan several generations away. This is a little town in Sweden called Nobotten. 
And a very interesting study was done some years ago by some Swedish scientists on what happened during the years in 1801, 1822, 1828, 1844 and 1863. They had very good harvests in those years. They were the good harvest years. And women who were pregnant during those years produced very healthy, big babies that grew up to be big, strong men and women. And their grandchildren as well. That's a bit hard to explain. Even if those grandchildren, their parents were maybe not in such a good harvest year. Nevertheless, the effect of the environment on the mother, on their grandmother even, affected how they developed two generations down the track. And there is further evidence that that may go on for even further, three and four generations. That rings a little bell, doesn't it? In the Swedish bad harvest years, this is what happened. Children were born malnourished and the grandchildren as well. How does that happen? That's what we call epigenetics. The environment can affect how the genes are expressed in terms of growth. And it's a very complex subject, which I can't go into right now because I don't understand it myself. <laughs> this man, Asad Maimandi, was adjunct professor of psychiatry, University of North Carolina School of Medicine. And he looked at that and he made this comment. The Nobotan studies suggest that evolution and environmental influence affect genes within one or two generations. It does not take millions of years. This is heretical. Suddenly we have evidence that Darwin was wrong. It only takes 25 to 75 years, one to three generations, not millennia, for evolution of genes to take place. And he actually looked at a study, um, because he was a psychiatrist, of uh, parents, particularly the women, who during their pregnancy suffered a severe psychiatric illness and found that the children of the parents had a four to ten times greater chance of developing a psychiatric illness and the grandchildren, two generations, and he suspected even more down the track. They didn't examine more than two generations. Haven't we heard this before? For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children to the third or fourth generations of those who hate me. Now we know how it happens. unto the third and fourth generation. Sounds unfair, doesn't it? But it's a natural consequence. It affects the genes. Ellen White knew this very well and wrote this. The well-being of the child will be affected by the habits of the mother. If before the birth of her child she is self-indulgent, if she is selfish, impatient and exacting, those traits will be reflected in the disposition of the child. Thus, many children have received as a birthright almost unconquerable tendencies to evil. Very interesting. Now we know how it happens. What do you notice about this picture? Looks like a couple of little bugs in there, doesn't it? Are they really bugs? Oh, those bugs are on the wings of another bug. What are they doing there? They're just artistic representations of what look exactly like flies to me. So who painted the pictures of the flies on the flies' wings? And if they just happened, what is their purpose? And how do they help the fly to survive? There's some good questions. I think sometimes, you know, God has a sense of humour and he puts these things in there to make us laugh a little bit. Why did he do that? But they're there. This man is an anthropologist and he talks about how people's views of the world depend upon their preconceptions. He says, in my view, objectivity does not exist in science. 
even in the act of gathering data, decisions about what data to record and what to ignore reflect the framework of the scientist. What he's basically saying is if you believe in evolution, you will collect data that supports the view. And on the other hand, if you believe in creation, you may do the same thing. No such thing. But it's science that claims to be objective. And so often they're not. This man is the most well-known proponent of evolution, perhaps, on the planet. At least on the media, he is. Richard Dawkins. And it also begs the question, if uh, he has been stumped by the fact that the mathematicians have shown that you cannot have spontaneous generation of life, it's mathematically impossible on Earth, why would it have been possible on some other place a long time before and developed to a much higher level than even we are to the point where it could create life itself? <laughs> the guy has stumped himself and shot himself in the foot big time and he possibly recognised that after the event. Now I'm not here to say that people like Dawkins and others are not intelligent. The scripture says the fool has said in his heart there is no God. But when you look at the Hebrew, the Hebrew word for fool is nabal and, and what that really means is the unbeliever has said in his heart there is no God doesn't mean that he's not intelligent, but he is not accepting the truth that there is out there. As Paul said, you can see the truth. And the more we look into the complexity of life, the more we realise that this cannot happen by chance. It just is not possible. Very quickly, this man, George Lemaitre, he was the actual founder of the Big Bang Theory, a Catholic priest, Jesuit educated and yeah. praised by the papacy. And the Big Bang Theory basically said that everything started off with an almost infinitely dense, very small thing that exploded and went bang, and then the universe expanded out of that. And people then start asking the question, well, what was there before that? Who created the, this little thing? Where did that come from? Oh, well, we don't know. So the latest theory is, well, let's just put that aside. We'll look at the expanding universe, and that's the latest, that the universe is expanding. Well, great, but it doesn't explain origins. This man, Professor Matt Strassler, theoretical physicist from Harvard University, who's worked on the Hadron Collider, um, in uh, near Geneva, um, he puts this um, graph up showing the inflationary universe and he had a few things to say which are quite revealing and I won't read it all but he says, how could we possibly know what happened at the very beginning of the universe? No experiment can yet probe such an early time and none of the available equations are powerful enough or usable enough to allow us to come to clear and unique conclusions. He talks about this being a period of ignorance and said instead, talking about the data, should be interpreted as a sign of what we don't yet understand. So here we have Dawkins saying, I don't understand, I don't know how it happened. And here we have this famous mathematician saying, theoretical physicist, 
saying, we don't understand either. We get back to our text from Romans 1, 19 and 20. What may be known of God is manifest in them, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. I'm going to finish off with um, something that was, was made for the creation Sabbath. It's a short video, which I will use as a finishing part of this sermon. There is a hole in the universe, and it threatens each of us with its destructive power. I'm not talking about the mysterious black hole in the center of our galaxy that devours everything around it in a whirlpool of gravity. Or the super void, a cold, barren cavern in space, so massive it drains energy from any light that passes through. No, this hole, so potentially dangerous, is located much closer to home. For deep within every human heart, there is a spiritual void and a haunting emptiness that breeds anxiety, discouragement, fear, and an unquenched longing for true happiness and purpose. The philosopher Pascal called it the infinite abyss, and it's a vacuum we try to fill in a thousand different ways. We race through life in frantic pursuit of material possessions, financial security, meaningful jobs, entertainment, personal recognition, and escape from the pain and struggles of everyday life. But each of these attempts is, at best, a temporary fix. For the hole in our hearts can never be permanently satisfied by any created thing. Two thousand years ago, God entered the world to fill the hole forever. His solution? A death and resurrection with the power to transform our lives. Now, that's a difficult concept to grasp, but maybe this will help. In the original Greek of the New Testament, the word for transformation is metamorpho. It is the root of the English word metamorphosis, the term used for an extraordinary event that occurs in nature. A caterpillar, earthbound, painfully slow and virtually blind, inches its way through life for a few short weeks, then encases itself within a chrysalis. Here inside a paper-thin shell, the caterpillar's body is broken down cell by cell. This is no death wish. Instead, the insect's deconstruction is the gateway to an entirely new way of living. In a matter of days, the biological structure of the caterpillar is completely rearranged, and the results are breathtaking. This incredible change is a metaphor for an even greater transformation God can perform in each of us. The metamorphosis of our heart mind, and spirit. Just consider his promises to anyone who turns from sin and accepts his gift of salvation. And the Lord said, look, I am making everything new. I will replace your heart of stone with a heart that is sensitive to me. I will renew your mind and give you a future filled with hope. Come, you who are weary, and I will give you rest. For I know your hardships and care about your sufferings. I will be your safe place in times of trial. I will forgive your sins and remember them no more. 
in this world you will have trouble, but take heart. I have overcome the world. I think this is an appropriate time to pray. Heavenly Father, we recognise the hole, the hole that we all have had and continue to have unless we allow it to be filled. We recognise that we don't understand everything. We recognise that we need to grow. But we also see that the potential is there that we can have that hole in our heart filled by the grace of Jesus Christ. And I pray that this will be the prayer of everybody here today as we leave and go about our separate ways, that you will bless us with that assurance that that hole can be and will be filled. For we thank you in Jesus' worthy name.